You may also want to diversify the channels in which you're engaging with folks. So maybe you send them an email on Monday, you give them a call on Tuesday, you check out their social media on Wednesday, you follow them, you like something, even just like liking something they did on Facebook or uh, LinkedIn, whatever it is, that's an engagement, it's a touch point. Um, and doing four touches in a week, especially if they're different channels, is a good way to try to nurture that lead um, and get them interested in what it is you're selling. Um, and so as people get to know you, then they start to like you, and finally they trust you. If somebody fills out a contact us form on your website, it means they trust you, like they want to have a conversation with you, they don't think, uh, you know, this is a scam or some like cheap uh, knockoff. Uh, you know, if they click the buy now button, I bet they're pretty interested in buying. However, we got to think about the math here. So let's say you've actually built this massive following on Facebook, you have 100,000 followers, you post something, only 10,000 of them see it due to Facebook's algorithm. Uh, and then from there, only 2% of people actually click on it. So 2% is actually a pretty good click-through rate for anything on the computer. Um, this is very different from sports, where if you're an NFL quarterback, you complete 65% of your passes, you're doing great, you might make the Pro Bowl. Um, if you're an NBA player and you make you know, 45% of your shots, 50%, you're doing pretty well. Uh, if you're a baseball player, you get a hit a third of the time, you're doing well. If you're selling things online, you're marketing online, and 3% of the people click on it, you nailed it. You're doing awesome, which means you can literally fail 97% of the time and still be really successful. The math, though, means you've got to have a lot of people at the top of the funnel where a 3% or 2% conversion rate, you get them to the website, then only 10% add the product to the cart, but your website isn't optimized. Um, so half the people who put in the cart don't actually check out and pay because you have four different pages they got to put their address and their billing and their shipping and do something else. Um, and then only 50% of them pay. So out of 100,000 people, only five of them bought this thing. And this is somewhat standard. Um, so I need you to think about too, as you're thinking about selling, that it, it is a law of large numbers game. Um, and so, you want to think about how many sales leads you need, what percentage of them um, are going to convert, and then what do you need to meet your goals. I'm going to go through these quickly so we can get to some of the closes. So again, it deals with what's the level of effort to sell. Um, and I showed you this Excel file that you'll get to play with to kind of build things out. And you also need to talk to customers to learn about their buying process. So we talked about this earlier in the semester, you know, there's the decision maker, there's the payer, there's the end user, uh, there's also the saboteur, you know, who are other people that this person needs to talk to in order to make the buying decision. And you can draw a great path of ABCDEF and then grade it sold. It doesn't mean the customer's actually going to go through that path. Uh, and so learning and, and kind of taking notes from your actual experiences about uh, you know, what were steps that you hadn't originally calculated that people needed to think about and what were some ways that you could streamline or really reduce friction. You want this to be as easy as possible to create that yes momentum and get people to buy. Uh, and in doing that, you want to understand who is your customer segment, uh, the uh, customer persona. Uh, I've got an article I'll send out uh, after class as well about thinking through who, what types of students want to buy this. Um, or what types of carefree travelers you know, would be interested in sleeping in a van hotel, um, and then prioritizing the customer segments that are going to bring in the most value, the most sales, have the highest probability of closing, um, and not wasting your time on these long maybes that end up not converting. And it's all about getting to yes, getting people to say yes, uh, and never telling them no. Whatever, and it's not saying that the customer is always right, that's kind of BS. However, you don't want to tell them no or that they're wrong or what they said was stupid or that's not how it works. Uh, you can do a yes and or a yes but. So there's this word but, which is kind of like a but eraser. Whenever you say but, it kind of erases the first half of the thing and then clarify what it is you meant or you want them to think in the second half um, of the um, presentation. So again, you want to know your audience. Um, there's different types of sales, there's different types of customers, and you don't want to overwhelm them. You actually want to whelm your potential customers. And by doing that, you're watching their body language. 
all right? You're engaging with the audience. Uh, you're not just driving the conversation and reading off a script of questions, like actively listen to what they're saying and be prepared to pivot in a few different places based on how they respond um, and make a connection. That connection needs to be forged between you and a customer because no one is going to buy from you if there isn't a connection that's been created. You can't exchange value if the trust isn't there, if there isn't a bond. In person is a lot easier. We can shake hands, we can make eye contact, we're connected. Online's a lot harder, all right? It's a lot harder to connect with somebody when they're like at home sitting on the couch um, browsing your website. Like, you can't really connect directly with them and if your website isn't set up to accept payments, there's literally no way to connect with them. So thinking diligently about how do you um, collect payments, is it a credit card processor, PayPal, Venmo, Cash App, what are all the different ways that you can uh, accept money because nobody wins if you don't close. And your goal is to make a win-win deal. And when I say win-win, one of the wins is in all caps. One of the wins has a capital W, all right? And so you want to make sure they got greater than or equal to the amount of value that you're getting from them. And a good rule of thumb is that you should be delivering five times as much value as you're getting. So if somebody's paying you $10, they should get $50 worth of value. And value can be measured in different ways. It's often intrinsic value. Um, you know, but if you're trying to sell somebody something for 10 bucks that they only think is worth five bucks, that's not a good deal. You're ripping them off and they're not gonna feel great about it. When somebody feels great about a transaction, they're gonna tell their friends and family and roommates about it. And you're gonna see a lot of benefits of getting referrals from other people they know when they go out and talk about this product or service because they had such a great experience with you uh, and with the thing that they actually got. And I mentioned it earlier that closing is 20% of the time and 100% of the money, all right? So with that in mind, I want to go over some closes. And these are different things you can say throughout um, the interaction with a potential customer. Uh, and I will share this book. It's 300 plus pages long. You jump to page 92, every other page is a close. All right? You don't need to read the whole thing. What I've done many, many times before sales trips or sales meetings is just read through these, refresh myself on what are some taglines, not taglines, but like one to two sentence things you can put in your back pocket to, to, in a closing opportunity, attempt to close. And if you don't close, that's fine. Go back to the presentation. Go back and establish more value. If people don't want to spend that much money, it's because they don't think there's enough value. So go back to talking about your features and benefits. Learn more about what pain points they have. You can also ask questions to make them feel that pain again. Um, you know, and be like, remember how uh, annoying it was sitting in the outfield watching the baseball game without any sunglasses? Like, do you want that headache every time you go to a sporting event? No. Well, why don't you try one of our sunglasses to see which ones fit? That's going to solve that problem. Um, so a couple closes for you to consider. One is talking about when do you want to take delivery. Um, and you can do this kind of early on, um, and it assumes ownership. Nobody's going to get something delivered if they don't own it. So if, hey, do you want to... Um, receive the delivery now, I can go out and grab it right now from the truck or my dorm room, whatever it is, or do you want us to mail it to you next week? And it's also giving them two, op two options there. Both options involve them buying. So think about it that way. If not, do you want to buy this or not, it's do you want to receive it now or next week? Uh, in both situations, they're going to buy it, they're going to pay you money, there's going to be a, a formal purchase agreement. Uh, you can ask, you know, would there be any other changes or additions you want made to your new product before we come to an agreement on the figures? So you're doing this before you necessarily talk about all the price and payment to make sure you've got the exact right product, the right model for what they need, what they want. Um, and it's an opportunity for them to say, hey, actually I need it in this color or I need it uh, a smaller size or a bigger size. This is one of my favorites and can be used in all sorts of circumstances to just ask somebody, you know, on a scale of one to 10, how satisfied are you with your current meal plan? All right? Almost nobody's gonna say 10. And so whatever they say, you just ask, what would make it a 10? And now, boom, they are telling you exactly what you need, what value you need to communicate and sell to them in order to bring that up to a 10. And if you can make them see that, hey, by buying this, we'll get that up to a 10, you'll be more satisfied. Um, 
you know, that can make a big impact and get them ready to close. Uh, it's also a great customer discovery question to just gauge where people are with their current solutions. Like they probably have something that's doing the thing that you want to solve for um, and figure out how happy are they. Are you all familiar with the net promoter score? Uh, so the net promoter score, I just filled out a survey this week for it. It's one question and it's on a scale of one to 10, how likely are you to recommend our product or service to your friends or colleagues? It's one question, scale of one to 10, a one to a six, that's a negative, that's a net detractor. Seven or an eight, neutral, you get no points. They're not gonna tell people about it, but they're not gonna not tell people about it. A nine and a 10 is what you want. These are your um, positive net promoters, and there's a formula you can calculate based on how many you have in the bottom bucket, the middle bucket, and the top bucket. The goal, obviously, is to have more and more people giving you a nine or a 10. Like You wanna get to that high level, and if somebody's current solution is a one to a six, they don't like it. They want something better. They're eager for a better solution, and it's your job and really your responsibility to present them with a product um, that you care enough about uh, for them to get up to a 10. So there are some payment closes in here about working with banks and lenders. I'm not too worried about that. <coughs> so another important thing you can ask is, you know, who will we be registering uh, your new TV's warranty? Your name, your wife's name, or both? All right. Any time there's an official purchase, there has to be a name somewhere in the contract. If there's a warranty, if there's an email address that you need them to sign up for, you have to get that information. So being prepared to ask questions throughout the selling and closing process to fill out um, a purchase order, um, which you know has their name, their email, their shipping address, their phone number, uh, the date of the purchase agreement, the products they're getting, the price per unit, the total amount at the end, tax, all of that stuff. Like that has to be calculated. Think about every time you've swiped a card at a restaurant or a store. These are elements of that sale. Um, so you can also ask, you know, whose name will we be doing the paperwork in? Your name, your company's name, or both? And again, it's figuring out that information because if they're not going to buy it, there's not going to be any paperwork. Um, so uh, a lot of people will stall because they have to talk to their husband or their wife. Uh, and so there's a series of kind of closes. It might be talking to a roommate for college students, might be talking to mom and dad, but they're talking to somebody who's not in the room. And your goal is to get them to commit to buy it without having to leave the room and go talk to that person because they might never even have the conversation. Um, and if you think, what if your spouse says no? Oh, they won't. Well, great, then I need you to sign here and here. Um, and then if they would say no, what do you think it'd be to the product or to the money? If it's the product, you need to sell them more in the value of the product. If it's the money, you want to understand is it the down payment, the monthly payments, the interest rate, uh, and all of these things are negotiable and variables that you can adjust to close the sale. Uh, and so this is great because I've read this ebook probably a hundred times at this point. I had never had a wife before, so I never able to use this one. This is now something where, you know, I can, oh, you gotta talk to your wife, that's great. Uh, you know, I agree, you should definitely talk to your wife, but if your wife is anything like mine, she never tells me no when I love something, and I never tell her no. So I need your approval here and here. That doesn't work, you know, better to ask for forgiveness than ask for permission. So let's go ahead right away. Some of these are gonna sound a little cheesy, and you'd have a hard time imagining saying them, you just have to practice. You practice saying in front of the mirror, practice with a roommate, with a colleague, like if you're on a sales team with other people. Um, there we go. Uh, so, you know, John, at this figure, considering what you know about the product and knowing your brother as you do, what advice would you give him about the purchase of the product and the fairness of the figures? So this is when the person who's gonna make the buying decision isn't in the room, you're asking their friend or colleague how you can help sell that person on doing it. Do you know? Also, the movie reminds me, Wolf of Wall Street. Yeah. It reminds me of Wolf of Wall Street. Yeah. Like, that's what like, they would you know, say, say to, to, to their buyers so often. They're just like, that, it, it, it's been asked forgiveness and it's been asked for permission and all this kind of stuff. It's just like, they nailed it, so. Yeah, a couple <laughs> other quick fun ones here. Somebody says it's a lot of money. I agree, it's a lot of money. I need you to sign here and here, all right? You can agree that it's a lot of money. It doesn't mean they need a discount. It doesn't mean they don't have a lot of money. Uh, you know, I agree it's a lot of money and expect that you knew that before you even got here. Let's go ahead. I need you to sign here, hand them the pen. Uh, I agree, and everyone who's bought this product says the exact same thing. 
Now I need you to sign here. I agree. And this isn't the first time and it won't be the last time that you spend more money than you thought you were going to. I need your okay here and here. I understand it's a lot of money and it's more than you had budgeted. Do it anyway. Treat yourself. You only live once. You know. Would you rather have fun now or die with a bunch of money in your bank account? A little morbid? Consider it. That one's bad. Some of these are not. Uh, this is an option, you know, if you can't do it for you and you can't do it for your wife, do it for me. You know, I'm a struggling entrepreneur trying to make a living. Uh, I really believe these products are going to help add value uh, and this money is going to help me, you know, buy dinner tonight or whatever. Like, make an emotional appeal there. Let me find a good one to close on. by saying sales is a lifelong skill. This was a 50 minute quick session where I tried to give you a high level looking at several different elements, breaking it down as a process. Things I want you to understand is you're gonna sell every day your entire life. You're constantly selling your roommates, your parents, your friends, um, and the better you get at it and the more you aware, aware you are of the skills and tactics and things you can use, the more successful you will be. I also believe that every human being on the planet would benefit from getting better at sales and listening to sales audiobooks, reading books about it, but it really comes down to practicing. Uh, and trying some of these things out, whether with classmates in front of a mirror uh, or, God forbid, in front of actual prospects, so you might actually close a sale and make some money. So with that,